again, Lawrence. We're starting off another one of our squeaky wheels. I think this is actually number 59. You know, we're when we celebrated 50, and I kept thinking to myself, my goodness, how many times have I listened to Lawrence ramble on and on? Now that we follow it with numbers, it's easier. Lawrence, we've listened to each other ramble back and forth 59 times. And I know we have done a number of our other muskrat tales where we do a little bit of um, teaching about the, the Métis community, and hopefully we get to share that with, with uh, the school children out there. But yeah, when it comes down to just you and I bantering back and forth, 59, we're, we're like, um, you know, the hockey players who are trying to get 50 goals in, in 50 games. We're at 59 conversations and 59 podcasts. Maybe that's not the same as a multi-million dollar pro hockey player, but in my head, in the world of podcasting, hey, we're doing all right. Well, you know, those guys put up at least 10,000 hours, you know, of training um, in what they do. And I think we're probably up to, what's he, 59, <laughs> probably maybe 30 hours total. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good point. <laughs> We, yeah, that, okay, that's a good point. When you do that whole, remember the whole conversation of, hey, once you've got to 10,000 hours, you're sort of an expert. So yeah, at 59 times 30 to 60 minutes, yeah, we're we're low on the totem pole, um, but we're high when it comes to enthusiasm. Lawrence, we got a lot of things we're going to jump around about today. I know we're, we're keeping some things um, local, we're keeping some stuff regional, we're carrying a, some conversations through the whole of Canada just as a result of some of the disasters that are happening um further expansion into where the world is right now when it comes to catholicism and the catholic church and christianity and who's who's making reference to who um i know we want to talk a little bit about the um you know some of the scams as as has become a bit of our conversation of topic because we're trying to inform everybody everybody who's a listener of some of the new scams that are coming down and then i know we're going to talk a little bit about sports but let's jump into something, Lawrence, that's that's right now, if you go west of our mountains, is a unique hundred year challenge, seemingly that that often pops into people's heads this term. Oh, it's been a hundred years. Uh, but the flooding in British Columbia. Well, I mean, it possibly is related to climate change. I mean, the the overheating of the planet in some areas is is bound to happen may not happen here in Alberta, but maybe over the mountainside. But I mean, they started with the forest fires to, you know, significant flooding. Maybe there's something there. Hopefully there isn't because we don't want to certainly our, our BC relatives to kind of be suffering for a year round. I mean, um, but it's certainly leading to a lot of challenges because that is a major network of what uh, we, transport of goods to other provinces too. So um, yeah, it could affect all of Canada. Oh, there's no doubt. You're absolutely right. When they were, I, I was looking at the numbers for how much tonnage, I think it was 490 billion. I think it was a phenomenal number of amount of product that comes into the coastline and then gets onto the railways. And if, and if those railways are shut down, absolutely. You know, um, my, my company, the Memphis group, I've, I've been in a number of conversations over the last few years definitely when the conversation about climate change people tend to ignore it until all of a sudden major disasters occur but i have been asked over the past well is there some way i could be more involved in overland flooding and there is a strong correlation between wildfires and the land as well as when it comes to topography but when water needs to move water needs to move someplace and when the when the train allows for it some of these areas were previously from what i understand were watershed areas, but they hadn't flooded in a hundred years. Well, build on them. And in fact, the land is fabulous if it had been previously a watershed area because the soil is rich. There's like the moisture content was there. So the farmers, well, then all of a sudden when the history of water movement comes back, the next thing you know, these areas are flooded and I don't know who's you know ultimately responsible. Should somebody have said you can't live there? I don't know. Yeah, and I think a lot has to do with forest management, you know. And I grew up in Prince George, BC, and it's a very lumber, um, lumberjacks everywhere. I mean, that that's just the norm there. But certainly, when you know the, the lumber prices start to dwindle and jobs started to fade, there's nobody really managing the forests. 
as much as they should be. And maybe that is a result, but that's just a theory of mine. And I mean, who listens to me, right? But, uh, <laughs> except but, all so, <laughs> our listeners and our subscribers, but apart from that, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, some, uh, some of it should be, you know, attributed to climate change also. So, you know, it's not the, the environmentalists kind of make things up, but they certainly take a, a different take. And, you know, certainly David Suzuki's comments, um, to about the pipeline certainly lessens their ability to actually say, yeah, we should be heard. Well, and thanks for bringing that up because there's actually a number of topics there, right? When you consider sometimes the, let's call it the bit of the Western battle, there's there's the province of Alberta who says, boy, wouldn't the safest way be to use pipelines to move product around in, in, in a way that can be easily monitored and safer? And then you have the environmentalists who suggest, yeah, but um, they don't feel as though they're getting enough say or the indigenous community saying that they're not getting enough say into how the pipeline moves. But then there's that battle of, well, you know, and I think we've talked about it before. Sure seems like the BC doesn't mind the the boats coming in and they don't mind refueling all of the boats and all the tourism. And seemingly they pump their, they use pipelines to pump their effluent out into the ocean and say that's okay without treating it. I'm not too sure, but this battle between Alberta and BC, um, you know, when the coastline is where our where our product comes in, yeah, that relationship of u- utilizing the the railroad seems to needs to be there. They certainly do seem to need the supply of energy in order to support their programs. Um, boy, I'm hoping we all can work together. But when David Suzuki makes comments like, "Yeah, well, you know, this is going to reach ahead and blowing up pipelines," he, uh, uh, what responsibility falls on him? For these comments, well, you know the thing. The thing is, you know, people want to make well-informed, um, well-balanced decisions, and mm. certainly when you make comments like that, and you know, I'm I'm advocating for both sides here to actually sit down and meet and talk about it. But when you do that, the other side, the pipeline companies, for instance, will not want to hear anything further along any lines coming from David Suzuki. So all credibility is kind of lost. And I think, you know, they do have a voice, they do have a say, and we need to get those environmentalists group to the tables. But it, when people make comments like that as one of their certainly um, representatives, then yeah, those companies will kind of turn their, their self away a little bit here. So it, there's no progress made from comments like that. Well, uh, yeah, it's inflammatory. It, it, it does, though, you know, I'm, I'm sure good or bad press is still press and it did bring attention, but you know, historically they've looked at David Suzuki and from what I understand owns a number of properties and drives expensive gas guzzling vehicles. Um, I agree. If, if you're an expert, you should be at the forefront of the conversation, but at what point do you, are you inflammatory to the point that you're no longer an expert? And I'm not the one to necessarily make that judgment, but I can assure you if all of a sudden violence starts happening as a result of somebody making these comments and expressing these these attitudes, well, there might have to be somebody who's held accountable. Well, and I personally think, you know, when, when you take those those roles and those comments, you know, there really should be an area that you should be able to back it up. And people like George mm-hmm. Clooney, who is a, you know, was an environmentalist, moved into and married a, you know, a lawyer and Mr. Yeah. Noel should be the spokesperson as far as I'm concerned and not Leonardo DiCaprio because anything <laughs> that he comes out of his mouth, right? And he has these big yachts with all these 20 year old women. It just, it loses that effort too. Right. So yeah. I think, you know, at some point in time, people have to look within themselves and if they want this political conversation, then be that political person, but don't try to upset the balance. Don't try to uh, be these dis- disruptors. If, all you're doing is not, you know, um, getting in the face of people. It's not quite disruptive if you're not working with these companies out there. Mm. And if you want to be a part of the conversation, again, we talked about it with many aspects of things that have been happening on our earth here the last year or so, the last couple of years, is be a part of the conversation and bring some science to your conversation, right? Bring something that's tangible when it comes to education in order to for your argument because if it's just well this is how i feel and and in in moving into the idea of 
that um, inflammatory things that can occur, you know, down in the US, and I, and I hope this doesn't become prolific, but the ease of communication when it comes to social media allows for people to um, plan events, as it were. Well, it seems as though there was a situation, which I can't remember the city, and I'm sure maybe you read about it, but they held a flash mob. Now, everybody, I think, thought that they were going seemingly into this, I think it was a Nordstrom to, to do a dance and right the energy that you see from these movies where it's a flash mob but then a number of people who may have organized it started robbing the place and then because there's so many people in to overwhelm any security or overwhelm any protection within the within that safe you know safe shopping space all this theft occurred now i understand they did catch some people and i'm happy they did so hopefully they can start to piece some of this where it came together but yeah, when you incite this, you know, incite people, whether it's you're trying to think you're inciting them in a positive way, there's sometimes there can be a negative effect on it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those choreographers, it took <clears throat> that much time to choreograph this. And there's always a few rotten apples out of the group um, of a large flash mob. Uh, certainly, <laughs> you know, you wonder it can happen at any time and people just take yeah. advantage of things because people are being distracted and security yeah. certainly worries about, you know, large gatherings and people dancing around um, because that's something that they can't control. And I'm sure they're all their uh, minds were on that. And then people just started, you know, shoplifting and yeah, pillaging. Sure. Right. So the, um, I guess the old days, the flash mob must have been for you when you were in the ballet yeah. and dancing. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people on stage just started dancing. Was that the original flash mob? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how we settled differences on the street, man. <laughs> we just danced. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it went, how many times was it a dance-off? <laughs> um, maybe 10% of the time. If, <laughs> yeah. But uh, if they were throwing rocks at you, maybe you danced around. Uh, but yeah. Well, I I remember being at a wedding a number of years ago of a, of a friend of mine. And this other friend was there. And it seemed like a great idea at the time. Dance off. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're just waiting for the funniest song to come on. And you start. I think I might have strained my shoulder that night. Like, it, it, it always seems like a good idea, but yes, if you're not a folks, if you're not a trained professional, like Lawrence is out there, be very cautious about how hard you get into a dance off. You just put yourself at risk. Yeah. I mean, I used to work for a company that did wedding, um, choreo choreography for a little while, but yeah, it's a, uh, thank God that stuff's dwindling. Cause it was kind of a little <laughs> bit awkward to, to watch people moving around or follow direction. It just never happened. Right. Mm. But, well, I mean, that's why if you're not trained, you typically don't know what you're doing. Um, jumping into one of the things we were talking about a little bit for, before I was reading, the Church of Sweden, in they are now apologizing to sort of their an indigenous community, the Sami S A with an accent a gu M I, and they're and they were apologizing for forced Christianization, in you know a lot of the same ways of that. The expectation was that the church, again, was um, putting forced, you know, religion onto these agencies. And I, I didn't read enough to determine whether or not it's extended to the same idea of residential schools or how the colonialization or and or such was occurring. Actually, I guess I can't suggest that that was colonialization. We'll have to I'll have to look and see who it was who was leading the charge on that but the the i guess the point i'm trying to really emphasize is the fact that this is not limited this has never historically been limited to canada mm -hmm. but we both know there's a pretty big figure coming down pretty soon and i don't mean coming down down this way i mean coming across yeah I'm trying well, to it. at I some mean, point i think at some point in time there has to be you know reactionary change and certainly change is what we're looking for and government mm -hmm. sometimes, when they legislate something, they take, you know, that ownership. And Canada certainly was instrumental in that for the residential schools. And what we're trying to, they're trying to do is bring the church truth to the churches so that they can have a chance to, to voice what they think. 
And sometimes um, when the other churches like United and, and all these other ones have said yes, and the Anglican church have said yes, you know, we were wrong. We're working with indigenous communities. We're moving, you know, a, a way forward to deal with all of this. Um, but then the Catholic church is just doing something else, but they're not doing anything, right? Right. And that's part of the problem is that they're not acknowledging it at all or even making a statement or an apology or doing creating no action at all. But certainly government, um, still at the end of the day, they're the ones that we're responsible to, right? So um, and those are the ones that we call the colonialism governments. And mm -hmm. the churches certainly had a role in that too, as well as the RCMP and and all those those things that in the Indian agent, right? So, you know, what do what do how do we hold all of them to a certain tone so it doesn't happen again? That's the whole purpose of all this. So it does mm -hmm. not continue to happen for the next generation and to allow these indigenous folks to heal. And it's great that Sweden is acknowledging it. It's they're apologizing for it. The church, um, especially too, I think that's great because that's a step ahead. And allow these indigenous groups to, yeah, let's let's work on an ability to make that change. But if they're knocking on the door and they're saying, hey, let's work together, and then the only reactionary tool from that that whether it's a church or government is to take you to court just for knocking on their door, well, then that's not reconciliation. That's not making those changes. Right. Yeah. And we're seeing that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely, there's, there's one part about acknowledgement, but then there's now, how are we going to reshape? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's not going to hurt an indigenous community if you work with them. That's what they want at the end of the day. That's their goal. You're going to have a lot of vocal members out there that will say, yes, they did wrong and burn the churches and all this stuff, but it's a very limited few that want to do that, right? Yeah, thank goodness. Again, we don't need to all try to be on the extremes, folks. We need to move forward in a positive way. So um, have your opinion, have your connection, but you have to yeah, try to pull the conversation a little bit your own way. And that leads us up to, I can't remember, do you know what the date is for the papal visit? Or when, when is that supposed to be occurring? Yeah, December 18th, I think there's a delegation from the Métis that's mm. going to the Vatican. Um, but going I, to the Vatican. Yeah, mm. but I know the Pope is planning on uh, coming to Canada at some point. Mm. Um, but certainly we're sending our delegates over there. I think there's six total from the Métis National Council. So they're heading to the Vatican and hopefully they have a you know a certainly rewarding conversation and talk about it and, and things like that. But, you know, there there is quite a few uh, Métis that attended residential school that Canada never acknowledged when the residential school agreements happened. And certainly that has to be certainly talked to Canada about. Um, but, you know, who knows what the Pope is planning? And that's the other thing, too. You know, whether it's an apology or some type of acknowledgement, you know, we'll see. Like a baseball happens. game or hockey yeah. game? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe he'll talk about something else entirely. Yeah. But well, baseball, I hope it's yeah. more about yeah, yeah. Having that conversation. And and imagine that. I think it was um, around September 30th. Yeah. Only a couple months ago that young Cassidy Karen was elected to lead the MNC. And she's one of the people at 29 years old. Um, pretty sure that if we had said to 29 year old Lawrence, hey, oh, and a couple months from now, you got to fly over to meet the Pope. That would have, I would have enjoyed seeing your reaction to that one. Oh, I would have gone there and would have said hi and all those fun things, but uh you yeah, high five um, dumb and uh try to give him a low five. <laughs> just like a baseball player, knock elbows, you know, knock the hands back and then just do a big jump into him. Yeah, like a bro hug or something like that. Yeah. Like <laughs> Um, but I'm sure the Vatican police would probably have you pretty quickly on the ground. Um, yeah, but, that's true. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, yeah, it's a, it's a very big role for her. Um, you know, certainly a lot of decisions making, especially with all of us going through self-government, we're all developing our own constitution, each province, uh, that has to go through Canada and what our nation will look like in five, six years, who knows. Right. But I know we're, we're moving into those steps now. Well, and I guess that leads to, um, yeah, Lawrence's recommendation that all events occur with a, with a bro hug, but the in-person meetings and events, 
Yeah. That's a, well, that's really tough for us to really sort of plan and work around, you know, like I would like to see something happen in January for us where we're having our seniors together, our business community, because that was always the norm here at the region. Yeah. And even with the past presidents, and I don't want to ever lose that connection that we have. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, moving the business mixers from the Northeast to downtown was sort of my thing. But as soon as I did that, I think we had, what, three or four sessions and then COVID happened and yeah. never really made that impact. But our numbers were better. Um, and then our seniors, they want to play crib. They want to play bingo. They want to do those things together and certainly allowing that to happen in some manner, in a safe manner. Uh, whether we're double making sure everyone's doubly vaccinated or triple at that time. You know, whatever that will be. So then don't bring back lawn darts. Remember the old <laughs> days of the, we shouldn't put those pretty much in anybody's hands where how high in the air can I throw this lawn dart yeah. and then essentially avoid it when it's on its way down. And thank goodness it didn't, you know, crack you in the head. But yeah, maybe it is better that we just allow cards and crib to be the predominant uh, toy or tool that, that we share with, uh, with our community so that, Lawn darts don't become that thing. Even they created these lawn darts where it ends up being a rounded ball at the end, but they're still heavy and they still hit somebody. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as long as we're that person is aware that there's a risk here, um, but to participate and please participate away, but don't. Well, when it comes to bingo, what's, I guess the risk is, is that your dauber runs out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is true. Or maybe we run out of cards too. Um, <laughs> that could be. Well, that's why it's always good to have a few extra cards and a few extra bingo daubers. Ooh, you know what I'm going to do going, uh, Lawrence, and, and I should have thought about it today, but, but, you know, unfortunately we weren't shooting in person just as a result of the usual issues of, well, all of a sudden there is sometimes occasional exposures. There's occasional risks. Um, you know, again, I, I make a comment every time we sit together that that's my favorite part. And I still enjoy, always enjoy our conversation, but it certainly is fun. And 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 we have that, you know, um, that folks, we're still working on some of the new set that we've had as a result of, um, you know, supplied product, our chairs, our kitchen party look. And we're going to continue to do that. But now I want to have a red light behind me so that it's that time of the show where the, the spinning red light goes, scam time, scam time, scam time. <laughs> folks, yeah, I, and I do have one as a result of, my band, I'd like to, uh, I got to bust that out and start using it a bit more often. But the scam I wanted to talk to you about was the one where the phone rings and it says in a robotic voice, this is the Canada Revenue Agency. We are aware. And the reason that that scam works and it works on everybody is, you know, if you're of the age where you've made a dollar and you are, you are one of those people who is filing your taxes. And you're always concerned that you have not filed them properly. There's always, it's not like it's always, hey, this is so great. I'm so happy I filed my taxes. I can't wait to hear from the CRA. It's always, a, oh, this is going to be an issue. So when that comes in, you immediately get heightened in the, in the, in the fear that this is going to be a bigger issue. But you must know, and you must get those calls, Lawrence. Who do you know that gets them? Geez, well, I mean, all of our seniors, certainly, you know, we try to bring people to them to, to give them a discussion to talk about scams. Um, but yeah, it, they're the ones that sort of be preyed on quite a bit. I'm sure if that guy listens and he sees an old name, oh yeah, let's call that person, right? And, like an old name like Lawrence. Yeah. But then I, <laughs> when I pick up the phone, I go, is that Ross trying to scam me? <laughs> right? Is he playing a Has joke on Has he disguised his voice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But folks, the point that I really want to make again, and it typically often comes down to this. They want you to touch a button. I want to explain something. If the CRA or the border security is trying to get a hold of you, they will mail you something. They will mail it to your house. Folks, they know where you live. So when you click a button, it opens the access on your phone to now somebody on the other side, the scammer, the threat actor says, oh, hey, uh, they, they pressed one. That means there is somebody there. Oh, hi, this is Steve, Bob, Lawrence with the CRA. Now they have you on the hook and they are now going to try and reel you in. They're going to try and fish and reel you in and they want information. 
and they will give you lines like, oh, um, yeah, to verify who you are, can you give us the last three digits of your SIN number? Well, that doesn't seem too threatening. You know, it's only the last three. They're just verifying. Oh, uh, sorry, I misheard you. Could could you tell me your SIN number? And often people, because that's who we are, will just read the whole number out. Or they'll, um, yeah, can you confirm some information? Because they may have just a little bit of information. Every new thing you give these individuals is one more tool that they can try to use to manipulate you. And they will use fear all day long. So don't answer any of their questions. You don't even have to say to them that you will be calling the CRA, but if you want to finish your conversation like that saying, I won't be answering any more questions, I will be contacting the CRA personally, hang up, you're done. There's my little scam of the week, I think we call it. And they also, they, and just to finish that off, and, and you know, there are always responses, well, we're sending a guard over to come get you, or we're calling the RCMP. It's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll call them too, right? And sadly, you know, how often is it that when somebody says, well, we're going to call the RCMP. Well, I just saw on the news, it took them 24 hours to respond to a bunch of other things. So I'll watch for them tomorrow. And I have every utmost respect for our uh, first line RCMP and, and our police officers, but I know they are overwhelmed. And again, folks, they are not being sent out to come and have a conversation with you about the CRA. No, let they the RCMP do, do their commendable work otherwise. But I yes. mean, yes. They're not going to respond to a scammer and, no. and all that and stuff. And they, yeah. and as much as they can be overwhelmed like anybody else, then they're, when you do need them, it is nice to know that they're there to serve. Um, uh, and, and we're very grateful for that. Um, Oilers, Flames, Vancouver, Toronto. We've got a few minutes left. Let's close out a little bit of conversation about Well, I think there's only two teams that you mentioned that are actually oh. worth <laughs> mentioning. <so. laughs> I think I might have met, I might have missed one, but it seems I never bring them up. Probably because No, you don't need to behind. Montreal. So, yeah. But there's only really <laughs> two teams, no, three teams in Canada that we're we're rooting for, Winnipeg and Alberta, and that's pretty much it. We have a chance. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. I actually I I, did, I forgot even about Ottawa because anything seems east of Winnipeg is struggling. Winnipeg has its ups and downs, but the Oilers and Flames Man, that's fantastic hop hockey that's happening. But sure seems like Vancouver's imploding. Um, they have they have nothing. Well, I think yeah, it's they've been good. They've been going through a lot of really rough two years, and um, but yeah, without a goalie, who knows, right? Mm. Um, but they have some good young players that will be good mm. in a couple of years. But that's about it. Yeah, and you know there were so many years with the Twins there that they just dominated they didn't seem to be able to win cups but they just dominated well now it's nice to see somebody closer to home dominating that's for sure that's right and the battle of alberta actually means something i think this year so yeah we'll mm -hmm. look, look forward to that yeah well as much as i look forward to that uh, lawrence i also look forward to each week that you and i have our conversation so um, folks, you may see some changes in the future here on how we present our show a little bit. We we like to jump in right off the bat into our conversation. Thank you as always. And you'll hear a bit of an acknowledgement at the end for all of the, the communities and the friends and the families that we connect with. And thank you to the Métis community. Um, Lawrence, I know the, the phone is always available for you that you'll always answer. Um, thank you to our subscribers, folks. Make you click, sure you click that little red button. And thank you to all of you who email us to ask us questions or send in some suggestions. You can always fire something off, tsw at thesqueakywheel.ca. And look us up, www.thesqueakywheel.ca, and make sure you keep recommending us to your friends and to those people who you dislike. <laughs> yeah, give them some <laughs> entertainment for the weekend, yeah. <laughs> so, Lawrence, I guess until next week, from all of us here at The Squeaky Wheel, we appreciate your time, and folks, let's keep the wheel squeaking. The Squeaky Wheel is brought to you by The Squeaky Wheel Company, co-hosted by the President, Lawrence Gervais, MMA Region 3, and the Captain, Ross Memphis Pamper. Our program is broadcast from Calgary, in Region 3 of the Métis Nation of Alberta, which is part of the historic Métis Nation homeland. We also acknowledge these lands are the traditional territories of Treaty 7, like the Confederacy, Sitka, Kainai, Gandhi, Lutsina, and Stony Nakoda, whom we share this land on the basis of our historical and ongoing relationships. You can always reach us for comment about our programming by email at tsw at thesqueakywheel.ca or find us on our website, www.squeakywheel.ca and our socials. For our comments, it is our focus to recognize all of our First Nations and Indigenous friends, share a connection with Métis settlements, and listen to and show respect to our Métis brothers and sisters and families. 
Here at the Squeaky Wheel, we give thanks to our elders for their guidance and to Mother Earth for her time. She allows us to be here and share her bounty. From all of us at the Squeaky Wheel, Danze.